Okay. Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Robert Saunders. I'm a software engineer intern here at Shopify. Uh, I work on the API patterns team, solving API design and implementation problems. Um, as a result, I work quite a lot with GraphQL, as Shopify has chosen GraphQL as a technology for the next generation of our APIs. Um, for those of you who don't know what Shopify is, Shopify is a platform that allows merchants to sell everywhere. Um, our roots are in e-commerce, but we now enable our merchants to sell on various different sales channels, whether that be your online store, uh, in a retail store or a pop-up shop, and even on social media platforms. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the GraphQL ecosystem. Um, so we'll start with an overview of GraphQL, and this should act as a good foundation for the rest of the talk, and get people from not familiar with GraphQL uh, up to speed. Um, next we'll dive into some different types of tools that make working with GraphQL easier, and then we'll finish off with a demo of one of those tools we talk about today. Um, the goal for this talk is to provide you with a broad overview of what it, what's available when working with GraphQL. Um, and it's important to know that a lot of the stuff we talk about today could easily fill their own complete talk, but I'm here kind of just to tell you that it exists. Um, so first, let's answer the kind of what, why, how of GraphQL. Um, so what is GraphQL? Um, GraphQL is a query language for APIs and a runtime for fulfilling those queries with your existing data. GraphQL provides a complete and understandable description of the data in your API, gives clients the power to ask for exactly what they need and nothing more, uh, makes it easier to evolve APIs over time, and enables powerful developer tools. Um, and that's from the GraphQL official website. Uh, I thought this was a good quote because it mentions tools, which is the focus for this talk. Um, GraphQL was created by Facebook internally in 2012 and publicly released in 2015. Um, so although it's a relatively new technology to the public, um, Facebook's been using it for quite some time. So as most of you know, uh, most applications today have the need to fetch data from a server um, where that data is stored in a database. So the responsibility of an API is to provide an interface to the client to access that data. Um, so really, an API defines how a client, such as your web or mobile app, um, loads data from the server. So there's been a standard around for quite some time uh, for API design. Some of you might know that, and that's REST. So REST has been a popular way to expose data from a server. Um, typically, you expose a single resource by one single endpoint. And to retrieve data, we would make a request to that endpoint. And we would rece receive a fixed data structure as our response. Um, so when REST was developed, client applications were relatively simple. Um, development pace wasn't nearly where it is today. And as a result, REST was a good fit for many applications. Over time, uh, these, as these clients have become more complex and data-driven, the way we design APIs has changed quite a lot, um, with three main challenging factors. So there's been an increase uh, in mobile usage, which creates a need for uh, more efficient data loading. Um, so as we know, our phones often go into poor networks, and data plans aren't cheap. Um, and there's been a variety of different uh, front-end frameworks and platforms, so it's increasingly becoming harder to build one API to fill the needs for um, all the various different clients. And REST makes this particularly hard because it returns a fixed data structure. And there's also been an expectation for faster development. So with REST APIs, if we need to make a change on the client, we frequently have to make a change on the server to support it, and this leads to slow product iterations. Um, so GraphQL was developed to cope with the need for more, flexibil for more flexibility and uh, efficiency. So it solves many of these shortcomings um, and inefficiencies. And all that said, REST definitely has its purpose uh, and gave us concepts just stateless servers and structured access to resources, uh, which both of which are very important concepts for API design. And of course, there are still use cases for REST. Um, for example, if you have a very simple API that doesn't need the complexity of a full type system that GraphQL provides, um, it's probably better just to opt for REST. Um, so at the core of every GraphQL API is the schema. Um, GraphQL uses a strong type system to define the capabilities of an API. Um, types are written down in schema definition language, also known as SDL, and we'll see some of that in a minute. Uh, the schema serves as the contract between the client and the server to define how a client can access that data. What's awesome about this is teams working on front end and back ends can do their work without further communication since they both know the structure of the data that can be sent over the network. Um, to illustrate how GraphQL is used, let's run through a quick example and see how we might retrieve data using GraphQL and how we might do the same thing in REST. So, um, we have a hypothetical application here. It's a blogging application to display the titles of the posts of a specific user 
And we also want to display the names of the last five followers of that user. So it's kind of complicated. A schema for this sort of application might look like this. We have a user type uh, and a post type. And inside the user, they have a couple fields, so like an ID, a name. Um, and so like name, for example, returns a string, which is a scalar in GraphQL. And you can kind of think of uh, scalars in GraphQL as primitive types and built-ins. Um, and the exclamation mark kind of means non-null, so it can't be null. And then we have our posts um, for the blogging application. And that's an array of non-null posts, uh, a non uh, non-null list of non-null posts. So basically what that means is you can't have a list with null items and you can't have a null list. <laughs> but you can have an empty list. Um, and then we have a followers field with a couple of arguments, last and first, and they both take uh, an int um, type and uh, neither of those are required because there's no exclamation mark. Um, and then we have our post type which has its fields as well. And at the top, um, you can see query type. Um, and this is a root type in GraphQL. And basically what a root type is, is it acts as an entry point for the client to access data. Um, the other root types in GraphQL that we won't really touch on too much today are mutation and subscription. Mutation is focused around mutating data and manipulating it. Subscription is more uh, around real-time data. Uh, and we have one field on the, the query type which is user, it takes an ID and it'll return you a user. So that's how we're gonna get our information. So this is kind of the data we would get back. So it's really nice that the response follows the same structure as the request. Um, so as you can see that, and it, that's what kind of like makes response much easier to work with. Now if we were to do the same thing in REST, um, first we'll need to make a request to the slash users endpoint to get the user information. So we'll do that. Um, and as you can see, there's a fixed data structure returned and there's a lot of information that we don't really care about, such as their address and birthday, because the client didn't get to choose uh, what data that they wanted. The server just gave us that. Um, next, we'll need to get our uh, user's post. So we'll make a request to do that. And again, a lot of data we don't need. And finally, we'll get the user's followers at the user's followers endpoint. Um, and so only now, and again, a lot of data we don't need. Um, and only now we're able to display the information we wanted to to the user. So what took us one request in GraphQL where the client specified the data it wanted, uh, took three requests in REST, and we got a lot of data that we didn't need. So to recap a couple things that we saw in that example, um, with GraphQL there's no more over underfetching. So overfetching being given data that we don't need, and underfetching being not getting data we do need. Um, and clients got uh, asked for exactly the data they need, and there's one endpoint instead of many endpoints. So it's pretty awesome. And before I finish this overview, to answer the how it's used aspect of GraphQL, there's typically three different use cases. Um, those being a GraphQL server connect with a connected database. Um, it's also important to know that GraphQL is transport layer agnostic. So this could be over WebSockets, HTTP, whatever. And also it doesn't care about the database. You can have a MySQL database, a Postgres database, NoSQL, whatever. Um, and the other use case is a GraphQL server that is a thin layer in front of a number of third party or legacy systems and integrates them through a single GraphQL API. And then there's a hybrid approach of a connected database and many services as well. Uh, so that was a really brief overview of GraphQL. Uh, if you wanna learn more, I suggest taking a look at these uh, resources. Um, one thing I didn't mention was uh, that schema that I showed you. Um, if you are interested in how I came up with that schema or how that schema was designed, uh, a colleague of mine did, the, uh, did a talk at the last GraphQL TO um, about specifically the best practices and rules we follow here at Shopify when we design our schema. And uh, that's the last link here. Uh, and I'll try to find a way to make this, these slides available to you. So now that you understand the basics of GraphQL, it's easy to see why people are, are getting excited about GraphQL, I hope. Um, and so they're actually getting so excited that the Google Trends data shows that people's interest in GraphQL is at its peak right now. And uh, surprisingly, this is legit. Um, all this interest and excitement has caused developers to build tools that make our lives easier when working with GraphQL. Um, now that's awesome, but it causes a lot of confusion. Uh, it becomes hard knowing uh, it becomes hard to know like what these tools are, uh, what the problems they solve, how they work, uh, what tools are right for your problem, and staying up to date in the community is just hard. 
So hopefully I can shed some light on this. Um, unfortunately, I don't have time to cover all the tools, as you can see, uh, nor do I have experience with all of them. Uh, that being said, we'll dive into some of the different types of tools and highlight some of the most commonly used tools uh, for the various different aspects of your application. So a basic application might look like this. There's three uh, components. There's a client, a server, and a data layer. So that's probably like your database. Uh, in this, in your application, there's really a four places that GraphQL comes into place. And we'll learn what each of these are in a minute um, and the most commonly used tools for them. Um, so as you can see, there's a GraphQL client, a GraphQL gateway, a GraphQL server, and database to GraphQL servers. Uh, I've decided to focus more on the types of tools rather than the individual tools themselves because there are a lot of different tools for specific languages and it'd be hard to cover them all, as I mentioned before. But instead focusing on the types of tools, um, it allows us to understand what they do, uh, the problems they solve, and then it's up to you guys to go and find the one for your tech stack, whether that be JavaScript, Elm, Ruby, um, or if it doesn't exist, go make it. Um, so GraphQL clients. At the very... Uh, like core, uh, a GraphQL client is something that constructs queries and sends them to the server. Um, however, some do quite a lot more. Um, just a heads up, on this topic of GraphQL clients, the code snippets and things I talk about are mainly from the something called Apollo client, which is by far the most popular GraphQL client and one I would suggest to use. Um, so with that being said, um, when we develop our front ends, there are a lot of things we do to manage making requests to a server and handling responses we get back from the server. So uh, before we had anything like Apollo, um, Apollo client or GraphQL clients in general, we would have to do some pretty nifty things. For example, um, in a React application, we might use a state management library like Redux to manage our state for us. And then uh, using Redux, we would fetch data using action creators that would trigger a middleware to retrieve data and then pipe that data back into our state using reducers and eventually back into our view via props. Um, that was intentionally complex. You don't actually need to know what all that stuff meant. Um, or you might just make the API request right within your components uh, by using the JavaScript native fetch method or a library like Axios. Um, well, sometimes that's pretty nice. Uh, it can be a lot of overhead. Uh, and when things grow more and more complex, you often find yourself coming up with complex solutions to, to something that really should be easy, which is uh, getting data from the server. And um, it also just generally distracts you from developing what really matters, which is a great user experience in your user interface. So um, it turns out that GraphQL clients can do a lot of the heavy lifting for us. Um, so let's take a, a look at some of the things they can do. Um, so the first thing they can do is pretty self-explanatory. Um, you can write queries and the client will manage sending that request for you and handle the response for you. The next thing a client could do for you uh, are view layer integrations. So there are a bunch of clients that bind nicely with popular UI frameworks and libraries. So things like React, Vue, Angular, etc. Um, for those of you who are familiar with React, you can write your queries and have a higher order component make that request for you and the data return to your view via props, for example. Um, we'll see co a code snippet in a minute. So uh, here you can see an example of using Apollo Client to make a query in a React component. On load, the component will run the query and make the data returned available via our props. Um, so as you can see in the list component, um, we access the data object from props, which is the data returned from the query. So uh, right here. Um, another awesome thing about these view layer integrations is that you get to co-locate your data dependencies and your views. So you have your UI code and data requirements side by side. So in this example, you can see that we have our request right beside where our, our uh, view is being rendered, essentially. Um, so basically with this tight coupling, uh, it provides a greatly improved uh, developer experience as the mental overhead of thinking about how the right data ends up in the right parts of your UI is uh, eliminated effectively. And uh, some clients even take this a step further to provide tools uh, for things like optimistic UI updates. So, uh, which is kind of like updating your UI before you get a response from the server. So that's pretty cool. Um, and here we do a similar thing, but with a mutation. 
Uh, for mutations, we don't want to run them when the component loads, because um, that would be bad. Normally, they're triggered by user actions. Uh, so instead, the higher order component provides our props with a mutate function that we call to execute that query. Uh, so here we execute it when the user presses the button by calling the method on props. So props.mutate um, in the on click handler. Uh, the next thing a client can do for you is handle errors nicely and pipe them back into the view. So similar to how we saw our query response on props in the last example, um, there, is, there was that data object. Well, there's also an error object, and that's where our errors go to. Um, because the schema has all the information about what the client can do in a GraphQL API, uh, client libraries are able to parse GraphQL queries and compare them against uh, the schema. So from there, they can validate the queries and even optimize them. Uh, this, greatly, uh, this is great because it catches silly mistakes early and can make your client even more efficient. And then um, some clients also provide you with a local cache and can be used for a variety of things. Uh, I've only had experience using it with state for state management. So for example, um, here we create a new Apollo client. Um, we specify our endpoint, our GraphQL endpoint, and then add some configuration for our state. So we spe specify our initial state with defaults, uh, which is just like a, a normal object, and then pass in our resolvers, and you'll learn what those are in a minute, um, and any types we want to use to manipulate our state. Uh, so in a way, what we've done is we've created a GraphQL API uh, on our client just for managing our state, which is really cool. Uh, then, uh, to the right, you can see that see a mutation that we've created to toggle a to-do item in our code. Uh, but to tell Apollo that we want it, uh, want it to use our local cache, we just add the at client directive, so you can see that there. Um, and basically, a directive is basically just a way to describe alternate runtime execution and type validation behavior in a query. So again, um, here we're just using the at client directive to tell our client to only execute this in the ca local cache and not on the server. Uh, and finally, um, to accompany our GraphQL client uh, comes some very powerful developer tools uh, that can do things like uh, lint your queries, for example, perform code generation uh, to make classes for your GraphQL types, and a lot more. Um, here's an example of the Apollo client Chrome extension. Uh, from, from this extension, uh, you can run queries against your cache and the server using the graphical interface, as you can see there. The graphical interface is like a, an IDE to allow you to run queries and mutations against your server, um, but Apollo Client gives it, allows us to do it against our server and cache, local cache. Um, and you can also just take a look at all the different queries that are being run in the client from the queries tab on the side. And here's another picture showing what your local cache looks like. So really, really powerful things. Um, so that's kind of an overview of what GraphQL, what a GraphQL client is and what they can do. Uh, two of the most pop popular GraphQL clients are Relay and Apollo, as I mentioned, uh, with Apollo being the most popular and probably the, considered the industry leader. Um, what's really nice about Apollo client is that it works with a, for a wide range of languages and platforms, and it's backed by the team that made Meteor. Um, and Relay is Facebook's client. Uh, it's said to be more performant. I don't know, I can't prove that. Um, but vastly, uh, but it's definitely uh, a lot more complex to use. And uh, as a result, my suggestion is to use Apollo. Um, it's important to know that Relay also exists as a specification for GraphQL, uh, where it adds information on topics such as like pagination in GraphQL with these things called connections. Um, in fact, at Shopify, we follow some of the Relay specification ourselves, um, such as the node in interface, mutation format, and connections for pagination. So all in all, GraphQL clients make developing our front ends uh, much easier for the reasons I just mentioned. Uh, so GraphQL gateways. Um, GraphQL gateway is basically something that uh, sits in between the client and the server to offer additional features. Um, so here's a look at the Apollo engine, which is pretty much the only GraphQL specific uh, gateway um, that's available and it's the most popular choice. Um, so normally these gateways are placed on top of your server or as a standalone proxy to route to the server, um, as kind of shown in this diagram. Uh, I won't dig too deep into what they are because I don't have much experience myself with them, um, but let's look at some features with uh, Apollo engine. 
uh, provides us. So uh, one thing is query execution tracing. So it allows you to see the entire route of the query um, and where it might be slow. Uh, there's query caching. So this is great because uh, as GraphQL requests are often sent to a single endpoint, like that slash GraphQL endpoint I, we looked at earlier, um, they're normally sent to that endpoint with post requests. So existing HTTP caching solutions don't work well. So instead, um, an engine can cache the responses of queries and keep that cache up to date through various different uh, cache busting techniques. Um, and there can even be an integration with uh, CDNs, content delivery networks, um, that make caching even faster by removing the latency uh, when making requests to, to gateways. Um, the other thing they can provide are error tracking, uh, like enhanced error tracking and uh, trend analysis, which allows you to see the performance of your API over time. Um, so here you can see an example of a trace report. Uh, this comes from Apollo Engine. So here we can see the, the get app page mutation. It's taking 16.2 milliseconds. Uh, but the settings hidden field is taking 7.12 milliseconds. And so what this allows us to do is uh, identify any bottlenecks in our API and we can work to make them faster. Uh, I really want to stress like how getting this in instrument instrumentation basically for free is insane. Uh, normally like you would have like a team working on this kind of stuff. Um, and there's some more. Uh, so the first one's like an error tracking graph. Uh, the second one's an incoming request rate compared to error rate. Um, and then the last one's a histogram for all your requests coming into your server. So in general, um, having a GraphQL gateway is really good for running GraphQL in production. Um, as it gives uh, you a ton more tooling uh, to find issues w within your API much faster, uh, in addition to some performance improvements with the caching techniques mentioned. Um, so again, some gateways, Apollo Engine and FastQL are the two main ones. Uh, so GraphQL servers. So um, at its core, a GraphQL server is a library that, you, that sits, usually sits uh, above a lower level language such as Express uh, or uh, Framework, Express, Django, or Rails. Um, they're responsible for receiving the query from the client, processing it, and sending back a response. Uh, oftentimes they'll fetch data from the database uh, as I mentioned before, they're not limited to one database. Um, in fact, they can query multiple databases and other web services and APIs, as we've seen earlier. Um, and so GraphQL is often explained as a front-end focused API technology because it enables clients to get the data they need in a much better way than nor like we've done before. Um, but the API itself is, of course, imp implemented on the server side. So. Um, there are a lot of benefits to be had on the server as well as, uh, as the client because GraphQL enables the server developer or the backend developer um, to focus on describing the data available rather than implementing and optimizing specific endpoints like you would do in a REST API. Um, so one thing that's uh, particularly good for a backend developer is the strong type system that GraphQL gives you um, because it really provides help con uh, control, uh, really helps control the data that's coming in uh, from the client and can help reduce data validation efforts on the server. Um, so in general, some things that GraphQL servers can do for us are uh, they make GraphQL execution easy uh, in addition to a concept called batch resolving. So GraphQL doesn't only specify a way to describe schemas and a query language to retrieve data from those schemas. It also specifies an actual execution algorithm for those queries um, and how they get transformed into a result. Uh, so this algorithm is quite simple at its core. Uh, the query is traversed field by field, uh, executing resolvers at each field. Um, the execution starts at the query type, so those root entry points that I was talking about earlier, and goes breadth first. Uh, at the end, the execution algorithm puts everything together into the correct shape for the result and returns that. And so, really, it's the GraphQL server's job to implement that execution algorithm, and that's what their primary focus is, uh, in addition to defining the schema. So, um, now that's great, uh, but there can be issues in the execution algorithm. So, in certain cases, you can actually make requests to the same place multiple times. Uh, if you're interested in like looking more up, up like looking more into this. Uh, I suggest you read up on the n plus one problem for GraphQL 
Um, but basically, GraphQL servers make it easy to use some uh, tools to make something called batch resolving easier. So batch resolving is basically just uh, grouping uh, one query, uh, many queries into one query. Um, and so one of the main benefits of GraphQL is that we can query all of our data as part of one schema and get everything we need in one request, as you guys saw. Uh, but as the schema grows, it might become cumbersome to manage uh, it all as one code base, and it starts to make sense to split it into different modules. Uh, we may even want to decompose it into separate microservices and deploy them individually. Um, so in cases like that, graph the, a GraphQL server uh, will make something called schema stitching uh, much easier. So schema stitching is basically just the process of creating a single GraphQL schema from multiple underlying GraphQL APIs. It's really cool. Um, so those are just a couple of things that GraphQL servers can do for us. Uh, but their main purpose, uh, as I mentioned, is to implement that execution algorithm for the GraphQL, uh, for GraphQL, and to specify the schema. Um, so here are some popular GraphQL servers. Um, here at Shopify, we use GraphQL Ruby because we're a Ruby on Rails uh, application. Uh, so database to GraphQL servers. Uh, so these tools sit above one or more databases and translate between the database and GraphQL. Uh, some can serve GraphQL clients directly and some might act like an ORM uh, for a database. So like a mongoose equivalent kind of thing. Um, they typically offer boilerplate functionality such as CRUD operations, so create, read, update, delete. And some expose more powerful database features. Um, so these really kind of save you time from writing uh, SQL queries in your resolvers and make doing more complex database operations a lot easier. Um, they're also highly configurable to meet your needs uh, if you don't like the way they come out of the box. Um, not going to dive into these too deeply uh, because we have a very quick, quick demo using one. Um, but here's a uh, an image uh, that kind of shows how Prisma works. Uh, Prisma is by far one of the most popular database to GraphQL services. Um, as you can see here, it's acting like an ORM layer for our GraphQL server. Um, what's really cool though is that Prisma can be used to serve our clients directly as well, <laughs> um, which means that it will take care of the GraphQL server for us, and that's what our demo will be in a minute. Um, so looking at a quick example, here in our resolvers, you can see a huge difference. So without Prisma, you have to make the, the MySQL query yourself, um, but with Prisma, uh, you can just uh, get Prisma from context and make a query for the user's entity. So it's a lot easier. Uh, so as mentioned, uh, Prisma is the most popular choice, but here are some other ones. Uh, Neo4j GraphQL is specific for the Neo4j uh, database. Uh, so to demonstrate the ease and power of a database to GraphQL service, uh, let's do a really quick demo uh, using Prisma to create that GraphQL API for that blogging application we looked at as an earlier example. Um, so I'm going to try to keep up with this. I recorded it, but I'm going to try narrating it live. So bear with me if I, if it's like off timing. Um, so the uh, first thing we want to do is globally install the Prisma package with npm, um, which is a package manager for Node. Some of you might know it. Um, while this is running, because the next part's fast, uh, the next thing we'll do is we'll run Prisma init with the name of our application. So for this demo, we'll call it the, a blogging app. Uh, what Prisma in it will do is it'll set a new project for us, uh, ask us a couple questions, and then populate our project directly with some files. Um, so we'll see here in a minute. First question will be about the database. Uh, okay, yeah, so here we've downloaded it. So we're going to run Prisma in it blogging app, uh, as I mentioned. So this is going to create our application for us. Um, and so it's going to ask us if we want to use an existing database or create a new one. Uh, we're going to create a new one, and we're going to choose MySQL, but could do Postgres if we wanted to. Um, next thing is we're going to go into our blogging app directory and open our code editor and we're going to look at the files. So as you can see, there is a Prisma YAML file, which is kind of like the, um, uh, the Prisma service definition. Uh, so just like specific information for Prisma, uh, that kind of shows you what your endpoint will look like on port 4466. Uh, and then there's a data model GraphQL, which is a GraphQL SDL based, um, uh, data model for our database. Uh, it looks a lot like the schema that uh, we had earlier, but um, as you can see, there's a couple custom directives that Prisma uses. So like app model, for example, 
on the user type is going to directly translate this user type to be a table on our column, for example. And like on the ID field, we're going to add the at unique uh, directive, and that'll make it like a unique attribute in our database. So the next thing we're going to do, so I created this, uh, so we don't have to make one ourselves. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to run uh, docker compose up, um, which is a command that um, will start our server for us and our database at the same time. And then what we're going to do is we're going to run Prisma Deploy, which is going to deploy our service for us. So we do that, and we're going to open up the GraphQL Playground, which allows us, which is like similar to graphical, but a little bit nicer of an interface. And we're going to start making queries to that endpoint that Prisma just created. So as you can see here, this is the schema that Prisma created for us, and comes with a lot of the, the CRUD operations, as mentioned. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create some users to be my followers for the blogging app. Uh, so here we have some mutations to create users. Uh, we specify their names. There's six of them. <laughs> I really like names. Um, and we, we want the ID and the name back for each of them. So we run that query and that's the data we get back, which is really nice. Uh, the next thing we want to do is we want to create me. So what we're going to do is we're going to create another mutation to create my user. And I'm going to copy and paste all of the uh, user's IDs that we just previously created to be my followers. Sorry, this is a little bit slow. Copying pacing skills aren't great. Uh, so we're going to run that, um, create user, and we're asking for the ID and name back again. So you can see my ID. I'm going to copy that for later usage. And uh, the next thing we want to do is we want to create my blog post. So we're going to make a mutation for that. So here we go. And we're going to connect me as the author. Um, and we ask for the title back. So there you go. The GraphQL ecosystem is the title. Um, and so now that all of the data is in the database, we can make that original query that we made earlier. The where in user. Uh, the where argument in the user field off the query type um, is custom for Prisma. Uh, you can make that ID like we had it before as well. But, um, so this is exactly the same query that we made before on the last five followers. And we're going to put the ID as my user ID. And we're going to run this query. And we get exactly what we want back. So we get the username, the post, and the last five followers. And we can change that to be the last three, and we'll get our last three followers as well. Um, and if we do first three, we should see Lee Byron there. Um, he follows me quite a lot. For those of you who don't know, Lee Byron created GraphQL. Um, so um, that kind of concludes the talk. Uh, hopefully, it has provided some insight into the world of GraphQL. Uh, so to recap, um, we got a brief overview of what GraphQL is. We looked at an example application and compared GraphQL with REST. We looked at the different types of tools that make working with GraphQL easier. Then we created and deployed a GraphQL server for our example application using Prisma. Um, and I'm sorry to say, but that kind of like really only scratches the surface. So if you want to take it further, I highly suggest taking a look at some of these resources. Um, and that's it. Thanks.